screen. It's pretty cool to see so many people here to hear this buzz as everybody's talking, catching up. It's good to be here. Uh, so good to be here today as we've gathered in the house of our God to to find rest from the outside world, from the daily grind. I know a lot of you as I look, uh, this is the first week of, of school and how that's different. Um, just been a long week probably for many of us, but we're here to find rest in the arms of our Savior. So I, I'm excited to join you in doing that today. I want to say hello to those of you joining us online, our, our military, our Marines, our sailors, military and civilian friends, wherever you're watching us today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Maybe just a couple quick things if you are watching online uh, that you can help us out better serve you. Uh, drop us a line. Comment below. You can email us. Let us know where you're watching, who you're watching with, and uh, how we can maybe better serve you with the good news of Jesus. We'd certainly appreciate that. Uh, this morning, as we look at another section of God's Word in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 8 this week, we're going to talk about how God wants us to navigate this truth of, of having knowledge and love. We're going to see how knowledge and love work together so that we can let our light shine and also bring people closer to Jesus. So that's what we're going to talk about as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 today. Uh, with that said, though, we're going to open with our first song. It's a, a new song that we sang last week. We're going to sing it again, uh, a song that reminds us of, of our Savior, right? There's a lot of stuff going on in our world today. There's a lot of negative news. You turn on Fox, CNN, your Facebook feed, you're going to see news report after news report that can be depressing and, and sad. And so with all that bad news today, the awesome thing is, as people of God, we got good news. We got good news, we got a rescuer, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he came for us. So we're going to sing that song that reminds us of that truth. It's called Rescuer. Stand if you're able to do so. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. Trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to this hour of worship this morning. We ask that you bless us, that you use this time in your word to strengthen our faith in you so that we can leave here today. Change, transform as your children to live a life of love and service first to you, the one who saved us, and also to one another. We pray all this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Please be seated. I already mentioned this morning that the section of God's word that we want to take a closer look at today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul begins at verse 1 and he says to the Christian church there, he says, Now about food, sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what it sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for both the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 
And do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. This is the powerful words of our God. We're now going to join together in in doing what Christians have done for hundreds and hundreds, over thousands of years. We're going to use the words of the Nicene Creed to confess our faith in our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I'm going to invite you to please stand as we read the words of our Savior in the Gospel according to St. Luke. Luke tells us that an argument started out among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Well, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you, all who is the greatest. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. For whoever is not against you is for you. This is the words of our Savior Jesus. We now get to join in and sing in our next song called Son of God. Please be seated.
mercy, peace are yours in abundance from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. You ever notice that there's just certain people that just seem to know it all? Right, they have all the right answers, they have all the right suggestions, they, they think that every time something comes up, they can just give you that advice because they think they know it, and they're going to let you know they know it. Maybe it's the person at the office. No matter what, they're the first one to jump in and chime in, and they have an answer, they have the solution, they're right, and everybody else should probably listen and get on board. Maybe it's that classmate, right, that, that's always jumping in, their hands the first one up, they're answering everything, and even out on the playground at recess or in the cafeteria, they let you know that, that they have all the right answers and, and you don't. Maybe it's somebody you even live with. Maybe it's those kids who seem to, to know a little bit more than they think they do as youngsters, or maybe it's that spouse of yours who thinks his way is better or her way is better. I think we see this play out maybe even more so online, don't we? I don't know about you, but it just seems like on all those social media platforms, more and more you see all these know-it-alls. We have all these people who, are, who are, have PhDs in everything. Everybody's a doctor. Everybody's a lawyer. Everybody's a politician. Everybody's a pastor. Everybody's this. Everybody's that. And they're right. And if you don't agree with them, you're wrong because we know it all. And you know the sad part? That's kind of turned our society and culture and made it meaner, more bolder, right? Because it's easy to just go like this and hit send and talk one-on-one -on -one with somebody, right? And a lot of people are doing that without even considering the other person. Now, it's not just 2020 America with Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and, and every other known platform to man to, to, to communicate this way. This problem with know-it-alls has been happening since the very beginning. It started all the way back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when sin came into this world. People began to act that way, like a know-it-all, right? I'm right, you're wrong. Your fault. You should do what I say. And so this is nothing new. And maybe I'm just going to rip the Band-Aid off right away. We all know a know-it-all, and at times we have all been the know-it-all. So why are we talking about this? Why is this so important? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. One, just generally speaking, Know-it-alls, wh when they throw out their, their I'm right, you're wrong mentality, it can cause problems in the relationships around us, right? That know-it-all at work, I guarantee you, whoever you think of, that's somebody you don't necessarily want to hang out with. You don't want to be around them. If they're constantly going to be like, I know it, you don't, you should do what I say, you're going to keep your distance. You're going to keep your distance from the know-it-all in your family. Or you're going to keep your distance from the know-it-all at church. That's one. But even bigger... When we act like the know-it-all, it has serious consequences among the family of believers. Now here's some truth for you. Here's some reality. Here's some knowledge that you all possess, right? By God's grace, you know this to be true. You know you have a God who loves you. You know you have a God who who was willing to hand over his own son unto death so that you wouldn't have to die and go to hell, so that you could live with him forever in heaven. You know that's true because God's told you. You know that you have a God that loves you so much that despite the times that you have sinned and strayed and been the know-it-all, he forgives you. He says, come back home and gives you a big dad hug and says, welcome home, son or daughter. And he keeps doing that every time you slip up and fail. You know those truths. By God's grace, you know. And that truth is something that God wants you to, and I hope that we want to, share with as many people as possible. 
And so as we consider this today, I want you to think of these two questions. Are we using that knowledge, are we using that truth to love and serve God and love and serve our neighbor? Or are we using it to be that spiritual know-it-all who oftentimes is not thinking about anybody but ourselves? That's what our God through the Apostle Paul today wants us to consider here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And so as we kind of navigate this, we're going to open with a prayer and we're going to ask our Father to be with us today. Father, as we've gathered in your name and in your house today, we ask that you bless us. We ask that you open our ears to, to hear the things you would have us to know and believe. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to not just hear it in an academic way, but now to live it to believe it, to trust it, and to put it into practice in our daily life. Dad, we ask that you forgive us for the times that we have been a know-it-all, because we've done that to others, but we've also acted that way to you, like we knew better than you. Forgive us for those sins and make us new again, so that in all we say, all we do, all we think, our words and deeds may be to serve and please you and also to serve and lead others to you. We pray all of this and ask for your blessing today in the name of Jesus, who lived and died and lives again for us. Amen. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to jump right in and we're going to read a couple of verses to bring us back up to speed of what Paul is really getting at here today. All right, he says to these guys, now about food, sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is but one God the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it's defiled. So what, what's going on here, right? This is kind of a hard topic because Paul this morning, he, he's addressing a, a bigger topic, but he does so using a very specific cultural thing at that time. Right? He's talking about food sacrificed to idols, now, I'm not going to go back into detail about what was happening in Corinth at this time. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks. But, but here, get this picture in your mind. Corinth is a big, bustling city, an economic hub, lots of things happening. And, and one of the things that would have happened there is the streets would have been lined with all these temples. Different temples to different gods carrying out their daily routines and worship of how they worship those specific gods. And oftentimes, how they worshiped was this. Right, people would show up, they there would be priests up here doing their thing, and, and they would take animals, and they'd kill it. They would do various things with the meat and the blood, sometimes pouring it over things, sometimes burning it. And when all that was done, there was always leftover meat from these animals. The goats, the rams, the lambs, you name it. And so one of two things would happen. One, they would take some of it, and they would go to the temple cafeteria, and they would serve it. So you worship, you go to the temple cafeteria, think maybe like a, a, a golden corral attached to the temple, to, to church. They would eat their lunch and then go on their way. Or they would take some of this meat, they would slap a price tag on it, and they'd put it out on the shelves at Food Lion and Publix and Lowe's and the Commissary and the Walmart Market Super Center, and they would sell what was ever left 
over for people to come to buy and consume. So the question then that they wanted Paul to weigh in on, is it okay to eat that meat that was sacrificed in these temples to these false gods? Can we do it? Should we not? What says Paul? Now, of course, like all the other issues we've discussed, this church divided. Right? You had some saying, why not? Go ahead and eat it. Who cares? It's just an idol. It's not really a god. There's only one god. You eat it in good conscience. Go to the cafeteria. Go to the restaurant attached to the temple. Go to the market and buy it. You're not doing anything wrong. Enjoy that T-bone. Enjoy that lamb meat. It's fine. And the other side? Whoa, wait a minute, guys. That's wrong. We, we, we can't be eating this. Right, that was used in sacrifices and in worship to false gods, not the true God, not the Jesus of the Bible. We cannot eat this. And keep in mind, a lot of these people, not too long ago, were worshiping and eating in those temples before Jesus brought them to faith. So again, Paul, is it okay? Or is it not okay? Now, I think if you've been paying attention to the readings today, and, and if you know Paul's readings in some other places in his writings, it's easy to know what camp Paul would fall into. You're right, guys. Those idols, they're false gods. They mean nothing. There's only one God, one Father, one Lord Jesus Christ sent from the Father who lived and died and lives for us, right? Paul constantly said, what I came to do is to preach Christ crucified. Those things are false. Who cares? So if you want to go to the market and you buy a ribeye that was, that was butchered at that temple to Zeus, you are not sinning. That's okay. Go ahead and eat it. And he could have said, you know what? I'm an apostle of Christ, so I'm right here. And all you people over there that are a little conscience-bound that says, oh, we shouldn't be doing this, you need to get over it. You need to get on board. You need to just eat that meat and stop giving the people over here that want to eat the ribeyes grief because they're okay too, so knock it off. He could have done that. But do you see what he does instead? He could have demanded, I'm right, this is truth, you should just do it, stop complaining, stop being so sensitive. He could have, but he doesn't. In fact, before Paul even addresses the specific question, he brings up a more overarching principle here, and the principle is this. Knowledge without love nothing. Now let me say that again. Knowledge, right? I know what's right. I know the truth. But without love, Paul says here, it's nothing. It's flawed, right? The words he uses, all it does, knowledge without love, it puffs a person up. I love that, that word in the original language, right? Or that idea of like, you know, animals might puff up their chest or maybe even the male species, we might puff up our chest, right? We're big, tough, we know it all kind of people, right? He says that's all knowledge does without love. It just puffs up. And it's only beneficial to the person who has it. In other words, if you know all these amazing things, all these truths about God and his word, but you're not using them in love, using them to love and serve God and love and serve your neighbor, Paul says it's meaningless, it's pointless. In fact, it's sinful. I can't help but think of Jesus' words. Right, he's in the upper room. It's the night that, that he would institute this meal and give it to the disciples for the first time and then give it to us as his people it's the night that he washes disciples' feet in sacrificial love and, and servant leadership. He says, this is how it is in the kingdom of God. Even the master gets down and washes the feet. And then he says this to them. All men will know that you are my disciple. In other words, you belong to me, you follow me, if 
you know every single detail about every single thing and you make sure everybody else knows it and they better get on board or else. Maybe he said it this way. All men will know that you are my disciple if you take my word and you use it as a hammer to beat over the head of somebody who's maybe struggling so they know because you're right and that's truth and they better get on board and they better do it. Because after all, it's right here in, in my word, right? No, that's not what Jesus said either. Jesus said, all men will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. The Apostle Paul, a little bit later on in this very letter, chapter 13, sometimes known as the love chapter of the Bible, right? We see it on plaques. We, we use it in weddings, although really it has nothing to do with weddings. It has everything to do with God's love for us and then how he wants us to love one another, which includes marriage, but not exclusively. And, and Paul in that section says this. He says, if you can preach and, and you can prophesy and you can do all these amazing things because you have the truth of God's word, but you have not love, you know what he says it is? Have you ever been in a room where somebody had some symbols and they went up next to your ear and they just go, <laughs> that doesn't sound good, does it? Paul says, even if you have the truth and you can do all these amazing things, but there's no love involved, it's like, it's like crashing symbols or a big gong. In other words, it's pointless. It's not beneficial to you. It's not beneficial to the other person. It's not helpful in the kingdom of God. Let me give you an illustration. Maybe this will, will help even better here to this morning, right? I, I grew up in a Christian home. And I'm, honestly, I can't remember a time when, when I didn't go to church. My parents took me regularly. I can't remember a time when I didn't know Jesus. We were in church regularly. Even went to a Christian grade school. And when that was done, I even went to a Christian high school where every single day we heard the truths of God's word. And then when all my, my, my friends and buddies were, were going off to, to college, getting jobs, joining the military, I went to a Bible college where for another five years, every single day, every single class I took was centered on the Bible and Jesus and God and everything that he's done for us. And then if that weren't enough, when I graduated there, taking some time off, I came back to the States and I went to the seminary, right? And I, and I went there and everything, even more so than Martin Luther College, Wisconsin Luther Seminary, we ate, we drank, we slept, Bible stuff. Until that day, they actually let me out and they gave me this piece of paper and said, you got a master's now and, and you can be a pastor in our church. And, and I'll let you in on a little secret, right? It's very tempting for pastors to maybe sometimes think, well, you know, I know a lot about God's word. In fact, nine out of ten times, the pastor, at least in our synod, because they train us so well, he is going to be the smartest person in the room with biblical knowledge. Nine out of ten times. Not always. And it'd be really tempting to think, mm, this is the truth. You need to get on board. You need to listen. All right, Paul even says that in one place in, his, word, in his, his writings, right? He even says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee. About, I was like the rock star Pharisee. I was trained under the best spiritual people of the day. If anybody has a right, and if anybody knows this, it's me. But he said, I consider all that garbage of knowing Christ and proclaiming Christ. And so the temptation for a spiritual leader is to think, well, I know the truth, and, and you need to listen but I'm not the only one who's tempted to think that way. Many of you grew up just like me. You grew up in Christian homes. You grew up with Christian parents who took you to church. 
took you to Bible classes in Sunday school. Maybe even some of you, at some point, you were going to Christian schools, or you do go to Christian schools. And those things are all great. Those things are all good things. But this morning, Paul says, I want to ask you a question. Are you using that knowledge? Are you using that truth to love and serve God above all things and love and serve your neighbor as yourself? Or do you sometimes use those things to puff yourself up thinking, I'm right, they're wrong, I know, you don't. And instead of leading people to Jesus, you're actually pushing them away. You know, this is what Paul is trying to get us to think today. He's trying to th- get us to think about this truth that just because we, we may have the knowledge, just because we might know some things by God's grace who strengthened us through his word, and just because we can do some things in Christian freedom doesn't always mean we should. Right? Paul could have stormed in there and said, this is reality. This is scriptural truth. And and you just need to listen. There's no such thing as idols and false gods. There's one God, so they're nothing. Eat the food. And and you weak Christians over here, you're just going to have to deal with it. Because us over here, we're right. And you're not. But he doesn't. He doesn't demand his way. He doesn't demand his rights. Instead... For the sake of others, he listens, he's loving, and he's patient. So that those people who are struggling might know Jesus better. That's what he's talking about in the last few verses of this section. Right? He, he says this, he says, be careful, however... That the exercise of your rights, right? You might be right in your presumption because that's what God's word says, but you have to be careful that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone is a weak, is with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? And so this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. And when you sin against them, right, this is not just a matter of personal preference. God says this is sin. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you're also sinning against Jesus Christ. So therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Wow. Do you see what Paul is willing to do or maybe to give up for his brothers and sisters? He's pretty clear here. I am willing to give up my Christian freedoms so that somebody else is not hurt in their walk of faith, so that another brother or sister is not wounded or hurt or pushed out I'm willing to give it all up. Are you? Are you willing to give up your Christian freedoms and your Christian rights so that somebody else might know Jesus, so that instead of pushing them away and being the stumbling block, you're the one that helps them draw closer to Jesus? This is hard. This is very hard, right? We live in a world, we live in a culture, and we have a sinful nature, all of which is telling us, you have your rights and you have your freedoms and you should not give them up for anybody because it's all about what you want and what you think. And and right? That's my freedom and that's my right. And this morning, God says, don't be that way. Don't do that. 
So what does that look like, right? And, and you're going to notice these examples. I, I'm, I'm pretty specific to the church, right? He's using terms like brothers and sisters. He's not talking about the culture as a whole. He's not talking about everybody in the city of Corinth. He's not talking about the government officials or the people in the temple that are sacrificing the idols. He's talking to blood-bought children of God in the church in Corinth. And so when you think about this, that's what I'm talking to. That's what God's talking to today. People that know Christ, people that are a part of his family, the church. And so think about it this way. God does not tell us how we must worship. He doesn't say whether we have to have page 15 in a book called Christian Worship that has only been around for 100, 150 years. He says if you want to, great, but you don't have to. He doesn't say you better have an organ or it better just be a piano or, or, or you better have a violin or you better get some, some cajones and some drums and fire it up. He doesn't say that. He says choose. He doesn't say it has to be super traditional. He doesn't say it has to be contemporary. He says you're free. He doesn't say what kind of buildings you have to worship in, whether it's what many of us grew up in, these big brick church-looking buildings, or it's a building a little more modern like this, or a storefront, or a tent out in a field. He doesn't say what we have to do. Think about the freedom Jesus gives you and me. And, and, and he goes further, right? Jesus doesn't tell you what you have to be when you grow up. You can choose to go to college, like some of you have, you can choose to join the military like a lot of you did. You can choose to go out and get a job. He doesn't say what you have to. He doesn't tell you where you can eat or can't eat. He doesn't tell you what to eat or what you can't eat like you did in the Old Testament. He doesn't tell you who you have to marry. He doesn't tell you who you have to vote for. He gives you so many freedoms in those ways, which is a good thing. It's an unbelievable thing. In fact, God, in his word, does not give us this play-by-play, step-by-step manual of how things have to be. Even though maybe at some times that would be nicer if he did, right? But, but he doesn't. He gives us so many freedoms to choose. However, he says this. Because everything I just said, we all have thoughts and opinions on them, right? We all have things we think we lean more toward this style of worship or this style of things or where to eat or politics or whatever, but that's all their opinions, their personal preferences. God does not command or demand any of them. And so God says in all of this, as you freely choose, as my children, with all the freedoms I give you, I want you to consider this. How is your choice going to affect the people around you? The things you say, the things you do, the way you live, the way you conduct your life and carry yourself, is it going to draw people to me? Or is it going to push them away? As we close this morning, I, I want to give you three really, really practical things that God says we can do to help us as we live out our Christian faith so that we're living for Jesus and we're living for others, okay? Number one, he says this. In fact, this is probably an eighth commandment issue if you remember that one. Pay attention to your words and your actions. Whether that's how you're interacting with your spouse, your kids, your coworkers, your classmates, your fellow brothers and sisters here at church, Pay attention to your words and actions and consider how others are hearing them. I could spout off a bunch of stuff, and it might even be true, but if everybody plugs their ears and doesn't listen, it means nothing, right? Knowledge without love. Think about what you say. Think about what you do in your life, and that also includes your online life, too. Is it bringing people closer to Jesus? Is it pushing them away? Number two, start with love, not knowledge. 
No, I know the, 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 the hardcore Lutheran in me and in some of you is like, oh, because we love to start with knowledge and truth, right? And we think that's, that's what God says all the time. We've got to start with knowledge and truth. Otherwise, if we don't, we're going to lose it. <laughs> start with love, not knowledge. Doesn't mean you forget knowledge. Doesn't mean you forget the truth. But knowledge without love, it does no good. And love without knowledge is just simply emotionalism and sentimentalism, so we need both. But start with love and not knowledge, right? I can't help but think Jesus, right? The woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, he didn't start with your committing adultery. <laughs> he started with lovingly actually talking to her when nobody else would. And so this means take an interest in somebody else's life. Right? You know the saying, people don't care what you know until they know you care. If, if you say you care about somebody, but the only thing they see is hostility and, and arrogance and puffed up knowledge, you are going to lose an opportunity to share Jesus with them. You just are. And I know that because I've lost opportunities because of my arrogance. So that means you got to listen to people. That means you, you got to try to meet them where they're at. Because even if they're not in their walk of faith where you are, how in the world and why in the world should we expect the newbie to be like he's been in the Bible for 50 years? Because it won't happen. So listen to others. Meet them where they're at. Try to understand their side of things and their hurts and their struggles so, so that you can lead them to Jesus. Start with love, not knowledge. Last one, most important one. Remember how Jesus sees you. Remember how he sees you and how he loves you and then treat each other the same way. At one point, you know what Jesus saw when he looked at me and you? He saw lost sinners. He saw people spinning their wheels and getting nowhere because we couldn't do it on our own. He saw people who were broken, who were suffering, who were hurting, who, who were addicted, who were caught in sin, and there was nothing any of us could do to free ourselves. That's what he saw, and in love, he came. He didn't just simply hammer us with knowledge and truth until we were six feet under. He had love and compassion. One of my favorite passages, Romans 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before you ever repented, before you ever cared about God, before you were ever concerned about your spiritual well-being, God was, was concerned about yours and he sent his own son. And he saved you. And he continues to love you and is patient with you every day. Remember how Jesus sees you. And how he loves you and what he did for you. And then show that love to somebody else. Because here's the truth. There is not a single person that you will, you will encounter today or tomorrow or the next week or the next month or the next year or your entire life. Whether it's a family member, a friend, a coworker, a classmate, your arch enemy, I don't care who it is, you will, you will not encounter somebody that Jesus didn't die for. No matter what you think about that person, Jesus died for them too. Remember how Jesus sees you and see and love people that way. Friends, by God's grace, you know these truths. <laughs> Right? Only because of the love and mercy of our Father, our Dad in heaven, do we know these truths, that we are loved, that you are forgiven, that you are saved. And now God says to your children, imitate that love. My love for you, imitate that love with others so that they may know what you know. So that they may have the same joy and confidence and sins forgiven and life eternal that I have given to you. Love them. Yes, share the truth of God's word, but do it in love. So that others may know him too. 
Amen. One of the things that we get to do, get to do every single week, is we get to bring Jesus the first and best of our offerings. We consider the love and mercy he's given to us, and now we give back to him with joy and thanks. Because part of our offerings, what they do, is we get to use them so that we can show love to others and tell other people about Jesus. So right now we get to give Jesus uh, the first and best of what he has already given us. Um, as you do that, if you could kindly fill out that connection card too, whether you're in person or online, that really goes a long way in helping us better minister to you. So fill out that connection card. Let us know if there's anything that you need, prayers or whatever. We stand ready to serve you. Gracious Father, we thank you for the mercies that you pour out on us day after day. We thank you for the gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you are giving to us, not only through your word today, but in just a few minutes through this body and blood of our Savior, your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Father, we, we ask that you forgive us for the times that we have been the know-it-all, the times that maybe our words and actions have pushed people away from you, not to you, and restore us again as your children. And equip us with joy, with peace, with love, with confidence to lovingly share with our neighbors, our family, our friends, and all those that you put in our path that they have a Savior who loves them too. Father, we ask you to, to listen to us now as we come before you with our own prayers and our own petitions. Dad, we ask you to hear us as we pray the prayer that your Son, our Savior, once taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, The 
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Brothers and sisters, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, his disciples, saying, Take it, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. Just one real quick reminder, as we've been doing when we do the Lord's Supper, we're going to kind of try to keep everything in a flow going this way. So Mr. Jason's ushering today. He'll help you come up this way, receive the supper. I'll come by the tray, take it out, and then we'll take it all together, put your thing, um, empty cup in the basket, and return that way just to kind of keep some flow. Thank you.
true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve into a true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace today, knowing that your sins are forgiven. Amen. I'm going to invite you to please stand if you're able as we pray. Well, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Please be seated as we join in singing our closing song, Glorious in Majesty. Yeah. I know they've been scrolling before service. They're going to be scrolling in just a minute here, but uh, just to, to let you know, and some of it that we've already sent out emails, we're going to continue. Um, the first one I want to bring up is Sunday school. Um, I know Miss Mary asked me today if there's any Sunday school parents here, if they could meet briefly out there in the gathering space. Um, are we going to go down there? Maybe so we can kind of get, okay, down there at the end of the gathering space to, to meet briefly. If you haven't yet, um, sign up with her. You can do that in person. You can do that online on our website. Um, Sunday school is starting, uh, virtual Sunday school will be starting the 6th of September. Um, and uh, so what we're going to do, at least for September, we're going to do kind of what we did at the end of last semester Sunday school. We're going to have those videos. We're going to have all the material you needed. Like there's nothing you have to come up with. Miss Mary and the Sunday school crew has been working really hard. They're going to give you everything they need. It's going to be online. It's going to be in your inbox. We're going to get it so many different ways. Um, and uh, so look forward to that. If you have any questions, Miss Mary is the one to talk to. If you're here in person today, make sure you stop by and talk to her if you have Sunday school age kids. 
Um, confirmation class is, we're going to start that sometime, hopefully end of September. So if you have a child in that sixth to eighth grade range, let me know. Sign them up. Um, you can do that online as well. In fact, I might almost prefer an online sign up or an email. So if you tell me in person, I will forget. Um, I know most of them, I think, that should be signed up. So if you forget, I'll be, uh, hey, guys, what's up? Is uh, so-and-so joining? So um, that's going to be probably the third or fourth. But first, we want everybody signed up by the sixth. And then we can work with the parents, especially the youth parents, how we're going to best approach confirmation classes. Some of you already talked to me, and I appreciate that. If you haven't yet, though, sign those kids up. Um, the last main thing I want to talk about, an online questionnaire. Um, the leadership is in the process of creating a new system to help us better serve Ascension. Um, right? This system is going to be a big database, which will help us communicate even better. It will help us, especially as leaders, um, to serve you better. Um, so uh, our comm director is going to be sending you information out. Um, feel free to fill out as much as you're comfortable. We're not gonna, it's not a demand. But again, it will help us, and, and it's going to help us even better generate like email databases and text reminders because we don't want anybody to be like, oh, I didn't know. Um, so we're trying to communicate even better with you. So you're going to get that email coming up this week. Um, help out our comm director, help out your leadership team, so then that can be put into this overall database that will be secure, it will be protected, um, and not everybody's going to have access to it, so, so that's not going to be an issue. Don't worry about that. Just a select few people that are doing some of the big ministry here, and especially the ones that want to help you spiritually, okay? They want to help you in your walk of faith with Jesus. So um, help us out if you can. Last but not least, a big thank you again to those who are serving today. Our tech team in the back, um, Dave and Caleb and Amanda for the music today was just awesome. Um, for, for those who are working behind the scenes so that you online can watch too. So big thank you to you guys. Thank you so much for making this happen. So as you leave here today, remember you go with God's grace and, and re think about ways that you can love somebody so that they might know Jesus too. God be with you.